I recently completed a teaching series on spiritual warfare, going through Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18 in detail. And what I did was I gathered all those teachings and I edited them into one video. And I wanted to provide that for people who would rather have just one really long video with all of the series rather than have it broken up into smaller pieces. So um, here is the entire spiritual warfare teaching series in one video. God bless. Hope you enjoy. We're starting a new series today, and the focus of this series is going to be on spiritual warfare, specifically Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. I recently did a teaching on the channel on Matthew 11, verse 12, in which Jesus says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. And in that study, we discussed the various translation options of that verse and the significance of each one. We then did a study titled Christus Victor, which focused on the first part of Jesus' statement, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, or the alternate translation possibility as the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. And we examined how both of those statements, both of those translation options are true and how um, they, were, they both played out on the cross. And in this series, and it will be multiple parts and fairly lengthy, we will study in depth the second piece of Jesus' statement, the violent take it by force. I believe Ephesians 6 gives a detailed explanation of how the violent take the kingdom of heaven by force. And I was surprised to learn that John Ramirez also links Ephesians 6 with Matthew 11 verse 12. And John Ramirez calls Matthew 11, verse 12, the ministry of violence. Now, he's obviously speaking in a spiritual sense, the spiritual ministry of violence. And Ramirez says, quote, The Apostle Paul was no stranger to this ministry of violence. He told us how to prepare, and he also told us how to engage. What exactly is the ministry of violence? It's the spiritual conflict that no child of God can afford to sweep under the rug. Remember, those who don't engage suffer spiritual loss. You cannot ignore the ministry of violence and be more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. If you want your God-given destiny to be fulfilled in the land of the living, you have to recognize how critical this ministry is. This is not the time to sleep. It's time to wake up, wear the armor of God, and put on Christ. The battle is ongoing. You have been called by the Most High God and are enlisted in the almost untouchable, unmovable army of King Jesus. The battle is real, end quote. So what I'm going to do as we start here, and this is just going to be an introductory episode, kind of in introducing the topic and introducing this idea of the ministry of violence. What I'm going to do is read the passage. And again, it's Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18. And Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the holy ones. So as you can see just by listening to that, there's a lot to unpack here. So this is going to be, as I mentioned, a lengthy series. Um, I'm expecting it to be somewhere between 10 and 15 videos. Um, 
and I will attempt to do my best to um, go deep in uh, my exegesis, of course, using the commentaries as those of you who follow the channel know. Uh, I like to go through the academic material and see what they say and try to synthesize all that. So uh, we're in for a real treat here, I think. It's going to be a lot of fun. And Clinton Arnold, in his commentary on Ephesians in the Zondervan series, he says, quote, Living a life pleasing to the Lord and engaging in the mission of the church is not easy because there are powerful supernatural beings that strategize and attack. Because of this, God makes available his power and divine resources to believers so they can resist the assaults of these hostile spirits and advance God's kingdom into the world. Believers are called to appropriate these gifts cultivate their corresponding virtues, and above all, pray in the Spirit as an expression of their dependence on the Lord to receive God's enabling power. End quote. We need to make sure we are equipped and also be able to help others who are not. And the Lord said to Ezekiel in chapter 3 verse 10, Son of man, let all my words sink deep into your own heart first. Listen to them carefully for yourself, then go to your people. That verse really touched me as I uh, just recently read it, read through that. And I think this is a blueprint we need to follow as well. That we, we need to make sure that we have taken God's truths deep into our own hearts and are living them out. Then we can help those around us. I think that applies to any area of life that... Um, that whatever the Lord gives us in our studies or in our reading, we need to appropriate to ourselves first. And as he said, uh, as he told Ezekiel, let it sink deep into our own hearts first. Listen carefully to the Lord's words and then go to, go to the, uh, those around us. So that I want to have that verse in our mind as we're going through this series as well. And as the Apostle Paul clearly lays out in Ephesians 6, and not only Paul, but the entirety of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation makes very clear that the believer's task of living in the world is set in a cosmic context. There is continual warfare between the cosmic darkness and the believer. And spiritual warfare is the conflict in the spiritual realm that affects the physical realm. Our weapons are also located in the spiritual realm. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. Romans 13 verse 12 says, The night is nearly over and the day is near. So let us discard the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. And 2 Corinthians 6 verse 7 says, We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand for attack and the left hand for defense. And as N.T. Wright says, quote, The real, ultimate enemy is not any human being or structure, but the dark, anti-creational forces that stand behind them and use them as puppets in their nefarious purposes. End quote. If you're in a fight and you don't know who you're fighting or the power you have, you're probably not going to win. And make no mistake, we are in a fight. We were born in it. We must know our enemy, and more importantly, we must know Christ Jesus and the weapons and armor he has made available for us. As Tony Evans says, quote, You have to fight the spiritual with the spiritual. Your human strength won't work. Your only hope is to be strengthened by the Lord and to put on the full armor of God. Through the cross and resurrection of Christ, victory is already won. The devil has lost. We are to stand firm in Christ's victory, end quote. And as John Ramirez says, quote, The devil is defeated by the finished work of the cross. Satan's time is short. Exodus 15.3 reminds us that Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh is his name. It's time to fight back. We are on the victor's side, end quote. And that's what we'll be studying throughout this series in the coming weeks and months. Identifying our enemy, our source of strength, and the weapons in our arsenal. As I said, I'm looking forward to going through this with you all, and I hope you'll join me. Now that we've introduced spiritual warfare, what we're calling the ministry of violence, we're ready to get into the passage. So Paul says in Ephesians 6 verse 10, 
finally be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Or as the King James has it, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Some translations also say his mighty power. So the emphasis here is that this is not your power. Paul is not telling believers to be strong in themselves. He's commanding the exact opposite. The strength for living the Christian life, the power to stand against the darkness, comes from an outside source. It is found in the Lord, period. As Harold Honer says, the verb be strengthened is best understood in the passive voice, to be made strong or to be strengthened. The power does not come from the believer, but from an outside source, end quote. And as Marcus Barth says, believers live from the incomparable power that was demonstrated in the past through the resurrection of Christ and the subjugation of all other powers. And that will now and from day to day strengthen the heart of each individual. The strength available to us is the resurrection power. God is our power in person. We can and shall rely on him, end quote. As Paul previously told the Ephesians in chapter 3, verse 16, I pray that according to the wealth of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner person. But we are responsible to seek God and also to present ourselves to him for filling with his power. As we read in 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, David strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. David was an active participant, and so are we to be. And Clinton Arnold says Western readers might be conditioned to miss the fact that Paul is calling his readers to a relationship of dependence and not urging them to draw on their own internal fortitude and strength. In the Lord clarifies that believers need to draw on divine power, end quote. And this is contrary to our culture which emphasizes independence and self-reliance. That is not what Paul is talking about here. The sphere from which one receives this strength is again in the Lord. We have to be in union with Christ. He is our source. As Marcus Barth puts it, a power which comes to man from outside is meant rather than an increase in strength flowing from internal resources. As Paul said in Philippians 4.13, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So the church, the bride of Christ, partners with Christ, is infused with his power to crush the serpent. The bride and, gri the bride and bridegroom working in union. As Andrew Lincoln says, Although the battle will become even fiercer, it is taking place now and the need for strength is a present one. And with his command to be strong, Paul is giving us the strategy to prosper spiritually in the midst of the battle against evil spiritual forces. This is not a passive posture we are to take. It is more akin to maintaining one's balance and remaining upright while knee-deep in an angry sea, as Lynn Kohick puts it. Paul's command for believers to be strong is also reminiscent of the Lord's command to Joshua as he was about to lead Israel into battle in the promised land. In Joshua 1.9, the Lord tells Joshua, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. So again, Paul emphasizes our strength is in the Lord. And when Paul says be strengthened in the Lord, he is speaking of Christ, as Paul often calls Jesus Lord in his epistles. And this isn't just my opinion. The, the scholars are the ones saying this. Andrew Lincoln says, quote, the Lord is Christ. Harold Honer says, quote, the phrase in the Lord refers not to God, but to Christ. And Clayton Arnold has the longest quote uh, that I'm going to read on this. And he says, quote, here... As elsewhere in Ephesians, where the phrase in the Lord occurs, it does refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is precisely through their relationship with the resurrected and ascended Christ that believers find empowerment. 
This power is only available through union with Christ and participation in his resurrection and exaltation. This power is not mediated through incantations, formulas, or shamanistic or magical rituals, end quote. So what we have here then is the deity of Christ also being emphasized in this statement by Paul. We make that connection because in Ephesians 1.19, the mighty power belongs to God. And here we have Paul saying that it belongs to Jesus Christ. So therefore, Jesus Christ has the same mighty power that God has and is therefore equal with God the Father. As Harold Honer puts it, in 119, Paul prayed that believers, by knowing God intimately, and let's just pause there for a quick second, let's not gloss over that statement, by knowing God intimately. That's a crucial step in this entire process, to know God intimately, to know Him personally, to have experiential knowledge of Him. This is not just head knowledge that we're talking about, but it's an intimate knowledge of God. So, as Honer said, again going back to him, in 119, Paul prayed that believers, by knowing God intimately, would understand his mighty power displayed through Christ's resurrection and ascension. He further prayed that they would appropriate this power in their lives. Now, Paul exhorts them to continue in that same might in the person of Christ. End quote. And again, that's the same might that God the Father has. And it's in Christ. As Paul told the Colossians that in Christ the fullness of deity dwells bodily. So now let's add a few Old Testament passages into this discussion of um, the deity of Christ and the mighty power being in both God the Father and Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 12 says, I will make them strong in Yahweh and they shall walk in his name declares Yahweh. I'm going to read that again. I will make them strong in Yahweh, and they shall walk in his name, declares Yahweh. So what is what is the Lord saying there? What, what is that verse communicating? Yahweh is speaking about being strong in Yahweh and walking in his name. So we have two Yahwehs in that verse. One, one speaking about another one. And this takes us once again, as we've discussed many times in the channel, to the Jewish concept of two powers in heaven. As there's Yahweh is invisible in heaven, and there's also from time to time Yahweh that appears physically on the earth. And this is, how, this is the Jewish concept of the Godhead. So if we were to translate this using New Testament language, we would have... I will make them strong in Jesus Christ, and they shall walk in his name, declares God the Father. That's what Zechariah 10 verse 12 is communicating um, in Old Testament language, the concept, the same concepts that we find in the New Testament. So Paul and the other writers of the New Testament, they weren't, they weren't making up the deity of Christ out of thin air. They were getting their theology from the Old Testament, and it's verses like this and others where they could be monotheists, worshiping Yahweh, the God of Israel, and also worshiping Jesus Christ because they understood this idea of the two, of the two powers. Same thing we see again in Daniel 7 and many other passages. So um, I'm going to read that one again and just in the New Testament, using New Testament language. I will make them strong in Jesus Christ and they shall walk in his name, declares God the Father. I think that's a really cool one out of Zechariah. And as we read before, 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, David strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. So we see throughout the Old Testament that the believing community was strengthened in Yahweh. So here in Ephesians, when we have Paul, he's telling Christians to be strong in Christ. So we see what's being said here, and that is that Jesus is Yahweh. The one who strengthened the prophets and kings is the same one who strengthens us now. But now he is uh, in, he's become incarnate, of course, and um, that's what Paul is communicating. As the scholars, as I've quoted, have said, it's, the, it's through Christ's resurrection and ascension that this power has been manifested and that uh, now the, this power is 
um, available to us if we appropriate it for our own lives. The same God who strengthened the prophets and kings in the Old Testament is the same one who strengthens us now. And that one is Jesus Christ. As Andrew, as Andrew Lincoln says, quote, Believer's relationship to Christ gives them access to his power. And Harold Honer says, His strength refers to the Lord's inherent strength. It is the supernatural power that has its source in the Lord's inherent strength. Therefore, the believer is exhorted to be strengthened in the Lord. That is, in the might of the Lord's inherent strength. And again, as they point out, the Lord is Christ. So Christ's inherent strength, because he is God in human form. He is God incarnate. So he therefore he has this strength, this inherent strength, that he makes available to us. And it's the strength that the believer receives is the same supernatural power that is inherent in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's incredible. And it's ours by faith for the asking. The supernatural power that's inherent in the Lord Jesus Christ is this power that Paul's talking about. Be strong, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. This inherent power is the power that's available to us. And speaking of power, Clinton Arnold says, quote, the repetition of power denoting terminology places rhetorical emphasis on the abundant power of God available to believers, end quote. And Thomas Aquinas, he interprets the phrase as God's virtuous power, which he defines as the perfection of power. And again, this is what's available to us as believers in Christ. And John Ramirez, he summarizes this verse very well. And he says, quote, To be armed, dangerous, and supernaturally effective in waging war against the forces of hell, just do what Paul said, be strong in the Lord. It's about being spiritually mature. That comes through total submission to the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It requires obedience to Christ, an attitude of humility, and standing in righteousness. Instead of acting on your emotions or carnal mindsets, maintain holiness and right standing in Christ. Then let them show up in your lifestyle. Being strong in the Lord means surrendering yourself completely to Christ then you will access all he has prepared for you in the fight, end quote. I just really like that as a summary of Ephesians 6, verse 10. So as we close our discussion on this verse, I want to read some verses out of Ephesians 1 and 2. And they're, gonna, they're going to, I believe, um, just be a good summary of what we've been talking about as well as verses to keep in mind as we proceed through our study of these verses in Ephesians 6 and our study of spiritual warfare. So I'm going to read Ephesians 1, 3, 7, 8, 19 through 23, and then chapter 2, verse 6, as we close out. And Paul says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with himself. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ Jesus. And it's this concept of Christ being above every ruler and authority, and us being seated in him in the heavenly realms, that's going to be very important as we continue through 
our study of spiritual warfare and the armor of God. So I want us to keep that in mind as we continue because that's the position that we're fighting from. We're fighting from this position of victory with Christ in the heavenly realms. In our last study, we discussed being strong in the Lord and how to carry out the command to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power is found in Ephesians 6 verse 11 where Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So we see the reason for putting on the armor of God is to be able to stand against the devil's schemes. As Clinton Arnold says, believers are called to appropriate a set of divine gifts and cultivate some important virtues that will assist them in their conflict with hostile spiritual forces. As Paul says in, a, in Romans 13, 12, let us put on the armor of light. So the command is to put on the armor. And the Greek grammar seems to suggest a sense of urgency as well as our, as our responsibility to put on the armor. God provides it, but we must put it on. This, and it's a spiritual battle, so it requires spiritual armor. And Clayton Arnold says, Knowing the truth of who we are in union with Christ, cultivating the virtues of this new identity, and using the resources available through this new relationship are at the heart of what it means to put on the armor of God. And Marcus Barth points out, that the armor or strength that is put on is equated with the new man who is identified with Christ. And verses to for further study that I'll leave you with to look up if you're so led would be Ephesians 4, 23 through 24, Colossians 3, verse 10, Romans 13, 12 through 14, and Galatians 3, 27. So Paul says to put on the whole armor of God, and this implies completeness. God's armor is fully capable of protecting the believer as well as providing offensive weaponry. Paul and the Lord, of course, want believers to be fully equipped. And obviously the armor that Paul speaks of is spiritual. Paul uses physical armor as a metaphor to convey the truth of the spiritual armor that God, the commander-in-chief, or Yahweh of heaven's armies, provides. And again, he wants us to be fully equipped soldiers. And as we'll see as we proceed, the armor of God has both defensive and offensive components. And multiple scholars point this out. These are not strictly defensive weapons, as some claim. And there is a debate in the, in the commentaries as to whether the majority of the armor is strictly for defensive purposes or if it's both offensive and defensive. And Clinton Arnold says, quote, In any warfare situation, there are both offensive and defensive maneuvers that soldiers must perform. All of the armor needs to be seen in both aspects. Believers will assuredly come under attack and need to take a defensive stance, but this will frequently happen in the context of making offensive inroads into the dominion of darkness by sharing the gospel and freeing the captives, end quote. And I agree with Arnold there. Uh, notice he emphasized all of the armor needs to be seen in both offensive and defensive capacities. And that's where I stand as well. And that's, so that's what I'm going to be presenting here as we proceed. Because I think Arnold said that very well. And I think that is the correct understanding. And God's armor is described in a few Old Testament passages. As Andrew Lincoln points out, Paul is aided more by his knowledge of Old Testament imagery than by his observation of Roman soldiers. But with that being, but with that being said, I do think that it's both the Old Testament armor passages as well as the culturally relevant Roman armor that we need to be that need to be taken together to gain a fuller understanding of Paul's intended meaning. So as Paul's writing to the church that's made up of both Jew and Gentile, the Jews would have been familiar with the, uh, the armor of Yahweh in the Old Testament passages that I'm going to read here in a minute. Uh, the Gent Paul's Gentile hearers may not have been as familiar with that, but they sure would have been familiar with the Roman centurions and the armor that they wore. So I think that Paul is drawing upon both 
the armor of God in the Old Testament as well as the armor of the Roman centurion. And if we mix the um, if we mix that together, both the Old Testament passages and Paul's familiarity and the familiarity of his hearers with the Roman armor uh, will gain a fuller understanding of what's being communicated. So the armor of God that's worn by God himself is found in Isaiah 59 verse 17, Isaiah 11 verse 5, and Wisdom 5, 17 through 20. Now Wisdom is not considered canonical um, unless it's in the Catholic tradition, but um, it might also, I think it's also considered uh, canonical in the Orthodox, but uh, it's not considered canonical in the, in the Protestant Bibles, but there is that, uh, there is a section in there about the armor of God, so I'm going to include that as part of our discussion. I'm going to read these passages. So as Isaiah 59, 17 says, He, and of course it's speaking of God, speaking of Yahweh, He put on righteousness as a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. And Isaiah 11 verse 5 says, He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. And then Wisdom 5, 17 through 20 says, For armor he will take his jealous love. He will arm creation to punish his enemies. He will put on justice as a breastplate. And for, hel and for a helmet, wear his forthright judgment. He will take up invincible holiness for a shield. Of his pitiless wrath, he will forge a sword. So we can see there that besides Isaiah uh, 59, 17, which says a breastplate of righteousness and a helmet of salvation, a lot of the imagery there that comes from those passages is tweaked a little bit by Paul. He takes the concepts and then he, he tweaks them a little bit for his own purposes. So we won't see direct exact equivalence for most of um, the things that Paul discusses, but the concepts are definitely being drawn from the Old Testament. And it seems like specifically Isaiah 59 and Isaiah 11. And we'll get more into those when we start discussing the individual pieces of the armor. But as we notice in all of these passages that I just read, it's God who is wearing this armor and going to battle. And this perfectly fits, fits with Paul's command for believers to put on God's armor. It's the armor of God. It's the armor that he makes available for his own. This isn't the armor of men. As 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not human weapons, but are made powerful by God for tearing down strongholds. And Marcus Barth says, quote, The allusions made to Old Testament passages show that all these weapons are used and tested by God himself and that they are first entrusted to one person on earth, the Messiah. Through the mediation of the Messiah and the Spirit, God's weapons are now transferred to all the saints, end quote. And as Thomas Yoder Neufeld notes, Quote, ancient armor served not only to protect, but to impress and intimidate. It represented the character and strength of the warrior and symbolized his past and present actions, end quote. So what we see here is that believers have been elevated to the status of active participants in Yahweh's war with the darkness. As the body of Christ, the church is now given Yahweh's own body armor. The armor goes on the body, and as Yahweh was enveloped in these virtues, so now are we to be also. So I just want to emphasize that, that as we are the body of Christ, the church is the body of Christ, the armor goes on the body. So it's God placing his armor, giving his armor, or making it available, I should say, making his armor available to his body, as his body is now... Um, active participants with him in his war against the darkness. And Paul's teaching in this verse is in direct opposition to the quote-unquote wisdom of the, philosopher, the philosophers and teachers of his day. Seneca stated that for the wise man, bravery was his fortress. 
and that he can use his own strength as weapons. The Stoics and Cynics taught that the wise man was self-sufficient. And Paul is saying the opposite. Believers can only stand and prevail through the protection and power of God. Which, as I mentioned before, this is also the opposite of what our own culture teaches. So Paul says again to put on the whole armor of God. And the purpose or reason that Paul gives for putting on this armor is so that we are able to stand against the devil's schemes or tactics. That's the answer to the why question. Why put on the armor? To stand against the devil's schemes. Andrew Lincoln says, quote, This language makes clear that the devil does not always attack through obvious head-on assaults, but employs cunning and wily stratagems designed to catch believers unawares. End quote. And John Ramirez talks about this as well in his material, the same idea that uh, the devil doesn't always come at you head-on. He, he's... He, again, as they say, wild, his wiles, like he's sneaky. Uh, schemes and stratagems and, and wily things. He tries to catch believers unaware. And Clinton Arnold believes that the translation should read, so that you are strengthened to stand. And he, as he states, the Greek word dynamai is a power denoting term. The Greek term also does denote lasting stability. As Honer points out, the one who stands is not pushed around. And Honer also says that this connotes a defensive stance. And he points out that the word against refers to a face-to-face -face relationship. And in this case, obviously, the relationship is hostile. As Andrew Lincoln says, quote, The decisive victory has already been won by God in Christ, and the task of believers is not to win, but to stand, that is, to preserve and maintain what has been won. End quote. So these guys right here are focusing on the defensive aspect of this. So in other words, uh, what Lincoln is talking about and what Honer is talking about, basically, I mean, what they're all talking about here is spiritual warfare is what we're terming spiritual warfare we don't give ground back to the enemy that christ has won for us as lincoln says it is because this victory has been won that believers are involved in the battle at all the call to stand against the powers is also a reminder to the believing community of their liberation from the tyranny of these powers and then Paul mentions, of course, the, the schemes or strategies of the devil. The Greek word translated strategy is only used here and in Ephesians 4.14. And in that passage, Paul explains how the church is to grow into Christ's likeness so that we will no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. And Clinton Arnold believes that the demonic involvement that is clearly stated in Ephesians 6.11 may also be implied in Paul's statement in 4.14. Arnold says, quote, The same thought appears in the Dead Sea Scrolls where there is a reference to the dangers of the, of the plots of Belial. End quote. And we'll see this theme tapen, taken up again when we discuss the flaming arrows of the evil one. And Arnold again, he says, it would seem prudent to see an expansive variety of ways that the devil hatches his attacks, a limitless array of intelligently designed plots. Which again goes with uh, what I said before from uh, Lincoln and also uh, as John Ramirez points out. And Marcus Barth here references the views of Thomas Aquinas on this section, and he says that Thomas Aquinas saw the viciousness of the devil in the fact that he does not attack God in himself, but in his members. So what that's saying is the devil is going to come at the body of Christ rather than try to uh, attack God head on. Which is, again, Thomas Aquinas' way of speaking about spiritual warfare. That the devil is going to come at us um, rather than try to go, again, just full bore straight at God. Because, as we'll see in our next study, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And standing firm is the language of war. As Clinton Arnold points out, standing should not be understood simply in the sense of standing still, but of standing up against the kingdom of darkness in an offensive manner. So there we go with the offensive portion. Now, the other guys were pointing out the defensive um, manner in which this can be used, and Arnold is much more... 
Uh, he much more focuses on the offensive aspects than most of the other commentators do. But it's this duality of offense and defense that's laced throughout this entire passage. And again, that's what I believe is being communicated as well. I agree with Arnold on that. As Psalm 144 verse 1 says, Blessed be Yahweh, my rock, who trains my hands for battle and my fingers for warfare. So there's clearly an offensive component to spiritual warfare. As we close our comments on this verse, I just want to ask the question, what about vengeance? Because the divine warrior, Yahweh, he put on garments of vengeance in Isaiah 59 verse 17. Yet this is not mentioned by Paul. Ephesians 6, the spiritual warfare, this armor of God, Paul doesn't mention anything about vengeance. So I just want to take a brief minute here and ask the question, why is that? Uh, the answer is because vengeance is not for the church to take. Deuteronomy 32.35 says, Vengeance and retribution belong to me. And that's, of course, God speaking. Isaiah 34 verse 8 says, Yahweh has a day of vengeance. Isaiah 63 verse 4, it's again God speaking. He says, For I plan the day of vengeance. In Nahum 1 verse 2, Yahweh takes vengeance. And there are many, many verses like this throughout the Old Testament. We could have quoted dozens of them. And Paul says in Romans 12 verse 19, Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. So as we put on Yahweh's body armor, and we are going to see again the offensive and, offensive and defensive components of this armor, we leave the vengeance to God. He will avenge. That's not what Paul's talking about in the passage. Um... He doesn't even mention it, and I believe that is the reason why. Because as, we're, as we are provided by God of uh, his own body armor, he still retains the right to, um, to do the vengeance. And that's clear throughout both the Old and the New Testament writings. In Ephesians 6 verse 12, Paul introduces the spiritual mafia, the forces of chaos. As John Ramirez says, quote, You cannot negotiate with the enemy of your soul. Stop compromising and making peace with him. All he understands is violence, end quote. And that's what we're going to be looking at today in our study is Ephesians 6 verse 12, in which Paul says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. So the first thing we notice is Paul says we do not wrestle. And scholars debate the reason Paul used the term wrestle instead of a term for warfare. But Plato and Philo both mix metaphors of sport and war. So Paul is not unique in his use of mixed metaphors. The Greek philosopher and historian Plutarch said that a fully armed soldier who was also a trained wrestler had an advantage in battle. And Harold Honer commenting on this, he says, quote, The fully armed soldier was an accomplished wrestler who on occasion would be involved in close quarter struggle against a cunning opponent. Due to the cunning schemes of the devil, believers need to be ready for both remote and close at hand assaults, end quote. And Marcus Barth believes that Paul's use of the term wrestle dispels the idea that a Christian can engage in battle against evil as if from the safe distance of a B-52 bomber. Rather, he stands in hand-to-hand -hand combat and bears the corresponding risks. And scholars also note that the literal order of the words in Greek are blood and flesh. Now, in most all of the English translations, it's going to say we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But the, the literal order in Greek reads blood and flesh. And very few English translations, again, pick up on this nuance. And scholars themselves aren't sure of the significance of the word order reversal. As Barth notes, a reason why the formula flesh and blood is reversed here has not yet been found. So I just wanted to point that out because that is... The way that it's uh, worded in the Greek text, blood and flesh, um, but the scholars just, they are not sure why, um, what the reasoning is that Paul had for, for uh, 
phrasing it that way rather than the usual uh, flesh and blood. Uh, that brings us to what's going to uh, comprise the bulk of our study today, and that's Paul's famous naming of this evil spiritual hierarchy, the spiritual mafia. Uh, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons actually has three entries on these terms. Uh, archon, which is the word translated rulers. Exousia, which is the authorities. And Cosmocrater, which is the cosmic powers. And Clinton Arnold says, quote, The terminology Paul uses here for these, for these spirits is suggestive of hierarchy in the demonic realm. End quote. So our spiritual battle is against the spiritual mafia. And I'm going to go through the Dictionary of Deities and Demons entries for these terms. Um, and as I said, that will comprise the bulk of what we're talking about today because that's really what the verse is about, as Paul is naming these entities and laying it out in a hierarchical structure. So first up is the term archon. And the entry written in the Deity, uh, Dictionary of Deities and Demons uh, for this term was done by David Ahn, who, just if anybody out there is familiar with him, he's the scholar that wrote the three-volume commentary on the book of Revelation in the Word Biblical series. So I thought that was pretty interesting that, uh, that he's the scholar that wrote this entry for Archon in the DDD. So Archon carries the root meaning of primacy in time or rank. And during the late Hellenistic and early Roman period, the term archon in both singular and plural forms began to be used in early Judaism and early Christianity and then in Neoplatonism and Gnosticism as designations for supernatural beings, such as angels, demons, and Satan, as well as planetary deities who were thought to occupy a particular rank in a hierarchy of supernatural beings analogous to a political or military structure. And so what Paul is giving us here is the hierarchical military structure of the dark side. There was a widespread notion in the ancient world that the planets either were deities or were presided over by deities. We discussed this idea in our study of the elemental spirits um, in the lecture titled Christus Victor and also uh, a clip from that that I posted titled Elemental Spirits and New Age Spirituality. And we discussed this idea that uh, the ancients believed that the planets were either deities or presided over by deities. In early Judaism and early Christianity, Archon was one of the designations used to refer to the evil spiritual ruler of human beings and the cosmos. So that's the end of the DDD section on Archon. The next one up is authorities. Again, the Greek word is exousia. And this term denotes celestial forces. And the DDD, Dictionary of Deities and Demons, points out there are no antecedents for the New Testament usage of exousia in the Septuagint or other pre-Christian Hellenistic texts. So the origin must be sought in apocalyp apocalyptic literature. And then they give uh, 1st and 2nd Enoch, Assumption of Isaiah, Testament of Levi, the Apocaly Apocalypse of Baruch, the Testament of Abraham, and the Testament of Solomon, as examples for where this term exousia is used in a similar way to how Paul is using it in Ephesians 6. And 1 Corinthians 15 verse 24 speaks of the eschatological destruction of all celestial entities as part of the completion of the kingdom of God. And these entities can also be categorized as the celestials located in the middle ranges of the cosmos. As the lists of celestial beings indicate, they are many in number. Presumably, they possessed their authority from primordial times when the Creator bestowed it upon them. But, since they became evil and demonic, the Redeemer had to subdue them. This happened after His resurrection when Christ ascended into heaven and took His place at the right side of God. Christ's enthronement may also be the reason why their names were withheld. God so exalted Christ that He gave Him the name that is above every name, and above every name that is named. As 1 Peter 3.22 says, Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to him. 
So I thought that was an interesting um, entry there, um, especially the section about um, the these authorities possessing their authority from primordial times. So basically when God created them, he created them with this rank, but then they rebelled against him, they became evil. And so then they had to be subdued. And this subjugation happened at the death and resurrection of Christ when he uh, rose and he ascended to the right hand of God. And I thought it was also really interesting the suggestion that they make here that um, why Paul doesn't name them. He doesn't give any names for these beings. He just gives their rank, you know, Archon or uh, Exousia, Cosmocrator, and so forth. And the suggestion here is that their names were withheld because they've been defeated by Christ and he has the name that's above every name and that he is um, the one who has gone into heaven and seated at the right hand of God and angels, authorities, powers, these things are all subject to him. So I thought that was interesting, uh, an interesting suggestion as to why none of these evil beings are given names in, uh, in this passage. So the next one is the Cosmocrator. The cosmic powers over this present darkness is how it's translated in Ephesians 6.12. And this term connotes uh, or the Lord of the world or the world ruler. And it occurs in pagan literature as an epithet for God's rulers and heavenly bodies. Now, the Septuagint does not use the term and the New Testament, only it only occurs here in Ephesians 6.12. This term is also connected with astrology in the pagan literature. As the DDD points out, the planets are called cosmocrators not only because of their function as an organizing principle in space, but chiefly because according to astrology, they exercise a fateful influence over man. And we see this sort of thing in various New Age beliefs today. Now, there are a couple of interesting lines in the Testament of Solomon that use this word cosmocrator. Um, specifically in chapter 18, verse 12, in which uh, 36 spirits introduce themselves to Solomon with the words, We are the 36 elements, the world rulers of this darkness of this age. And that's the word cosmocrator, the world rulers of the darkness of this age. So again, that's the same term that Paul uses here in Ephesians. And the Dictionary of Deities and Demons goes on to say the battle of the Christians has cosmic dimensions. And we've discussed that um, in, in many places in this uh, series already and in various videos in the channel. But the DDD goes on to point out that cosmocrators refers to the demon world governed by the devil. And in Irenaeus, the term has developed into a direct reference to the devil. And as Irenaeus says, the devil is one is the one whom is called Cosmocrator. So there definitely, as we've gone through that, there definitely seems to be crossover in the literature as to how these terms were used and which entities were identified with each. So it does make it difficult to clearly define the hierarchy, even though it clearly appears that Paul is stating there is one. And I do agree that that is what Paul is communicating here. Um, we just see some, some sloppiness in extra-biblical writings when the authors of these other non-biblical, non-inspired texts are using these terms. They're not as crisp as Paul is, and so some of the water is muddied, so to speak, in that, um, in that way. And so it becomes more difficult to clearly define the hierarchy as uh, or understand the hierarchy as Paul has laid it out here but I do think that's what's being stated and so it's just some of our understanding because of these non-biblical texts have confused the distinctions a bit and the last term that Paul uses the evil spirits um, I'm actually with the minority view here because most scholars see that term evil spirits also translated sometimes as spiritual armies as a term that's simply used to further describe the rulers mentioned above. Now, I don't agree with that. 
I think that this is describing the lowest level in the hierarchy, um, which would be the demons themselves, the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. So as Paul is giving us this hierarchy, and the scholars agree that he is giving a hierarchy, I, I'm not sure why they, when they get to evil spirits, they just say, well, this is a catch-all term for all the, the all the above kind of a thing. I, I don't think so. I think this is the lowest level in the rung, the lowest uh, piece of the hierarchy. So it goes from uh, rulers, authorities, you know, cosmic rulers of the darkness to evil spirits, the demons. And demons are personal malevolent beings. And the essential character of all these beings named by Paul is wickedness. So I do agree with that. And they will, these entities will respond to worship and offerings, but they never work for free. The Dead Sea Scrolls speak of the angel of darkness or the spirit of evil. And he is said to work by malice and lie, pride and arrogance of heart, denial, cheating, and hypocrisy. As Harold Honer points out, the cosmic rulers of darkness are in conflict with the god of light. Now I just want to say right there that Honer says the cosmic rulers of darkness, um, specifically Paul uses that again for the cosmic crotters. So, uh, but I think, but I think what Honer is using it again as more of a catch-all statement that the cosmic rulers of darkness, the entire hierarchy, is in conflict with the god of light, which is clearly, I mean, that's clearly correct. There's no doubt about that. And that's what we see also Paul communicate in Acts 26, 17, and 18 when, well, he's Paul is here in this passage quoting what the Lord told him at the start of Paul's ministry. So this is Paul quoting the Lord. So it's really the Lord speaking. He says, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So that's what this battle is about. As this hierarchy of evil, all these rebellious beings, these gods and uh, demonic forces are in conflict with the God of light. And the, and the mission of Christ, why he came, was to destroy the works of the devil. And then he sends, you know, the Great Commission, he sends the church out to make disciples of all the nations to as he told Paul, to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So in addition to being at war with God and believers, there is also war between these evil gods. And this is pointed out by people who do um, deliverance type ministries. Uh, they'll talk about this. And... At this point, you might ask, isn't that statement that the, there's war between the rebel gods, isn't that in violation of Matthew 12, 26, in which Jesus said, if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. Now, I've thought about this, and um, this part, I mean, this is just my opinion, but I don't think that that's in conflict with the idea of there being war between the gods, the evil gods. Because Jesus specifically said that if Satan casts out Satan, and this means that Satan is not divided in his purposes, because if he were divided in, in his own purposes, then his kingdom would not survive. But I don't think that necessarily means that Satan wouldn't throw a, a demons under the bus if it was... if it were to further his own agenda to further deceive and lead people further into darkness. And in the context of Matthew 12, why the Pharisees accused Jesus of casting out demons by Beelzebub, in the context of that whole scene, Jesus was bringing complete healing to the possessed man. That man was set free by the ministry of Jesus. And that is what Satan never does. He brings further deception and bondage. Uh, Jesus' statement also doesn't mean, I don't believe, that the gods don't war against each other for territory and worship. Again, if that furthers their agenda to enslave humanity, to receive worship, uh, to cause destruction and death of God's image bearers, that's what they're about. So they war against each other in this process, but their ultimate agenda is carried forward. 
And we see that in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 48 and 49, Jeremiah is um, prophesying against the nations. And as part of the prophecy against Moab, in Jeremiah 48, 7, he says to them, Your God, Chemosh, will go into exile. And in his prophecy of the Ammonites, in 49.3, he says, For your God, Molech, with his priests and officials, will be hauled off to distant lands. So these are the idea, this idea that Jeremiah is saying here, is the gods of these nations are going to be taken into exile um, as the Babylonians come in and conquer the territory. So the ancients viewed war as a battle between their gods and the gods of the opposing kingdoms. We see this clearly in the writings of the Assyrians that we, that we discussed in our study of Nahum. So they believed that whichever army won had the stronger gods. So if we try to bring this together here as we finish up this section, we read in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 17, it says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For all things in heaven and on earth were created by him. All things, whether visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions, whether principalities or powers. And there's our terms again that Paul used in Ephesians 6. So again, back to Colossians, and he says, All things were created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and all things are held together in him. So Jesus created everything, yet many of his creatures chose to rebel and wage war against him, both his human creation and his supernatural creation. And he defeated them at the cross and resurrection is now seated at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. As we discussed in uh, the Dictionary of Deities and Demons article um, a few minutes ago. And we are seated in him. So we've mentioned that before in this series as well. So we need to remember this going forward, that we are to see ourselves as fighting from a position of victory since we have already been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So as this war uh, rages all around us, as the gods war amongst themselves, and we can see this in you know in the just the religions of the world as all as the pagan the non-Christian religions often war with each other. Um, and we see this spiritual mafia behind these uh, human conflicts. The book of Revelation also makes this clear when it says that uh, the three unclean spirits like frogs go out to gather the nations to Armageddon, um, bringing everybody together to this fight. The supernatural war is also carried out in the terrestrial and again that's what we're talking about spiritual warfare the spiritual war that um, we are all involved in from birth so as these entities war against each other for worship and power and domination they're ultimately at war with Christ and that's Satan's ultimate uh, agenda is to try to defeat God and take his throne. So as all this is going, going on all around us, we need to remember and see ourselves as fighting from position of victory. As Paul says in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us because we have been united with him and are seated with him in the heavenly realms and he has already won this victory. After exposing the spiritual mafia, the evil powers with whom we wrestle in verse 12, Paul states in Ephesians 6 verse 13, For this reason, take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, and having prepared everything to take your stand. So for this reason, and what reason is that? The reason is because our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's this spiritual and cosmic nature of our enemy and warfare that makes God's spiritual armor absolutely necessary. Because our enemy is a spiritual foe, we need spiritual armor. The battle is a constant one, and our hope is in the Lord's strength and the armor he provides. 
The powers of darkness have been defeated by Christ, but they are still active, and we can't afford to be complacent. As Andrew Lincoln says, quote, A call both to be ready for battle and to stand firm in the battle that's already in progress. That's, what's ha that's what Paul is talking about here. And therefore, on account of this, because of this battle, because our foe is not flesh and blood, we're to take up God's armor, as we've discussed before. As Harold Honer points out, quote, The entire armor is absolutely necessary in the spiritual warfare against the devil and his angels. The exhortation is directed to both the individual and the corporate body, the church. The body of believers is in this warfare together. As the Roman soldier did not fight alone, so must believers as a body, united under their commander-in-chief, stand against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. End quote. And that's important. Again, that's, that's important. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that as we go as well. But that's an important point. Um, while, again, our culture tends to emphasize individuality, and so, as we read the scriptures through our cultural lens, the way we were raised, we tend to see these things as fully um, individualistic. But as Honer and other scholars point out, um, this exhortation is also directed at the corporate body. Because it's the body of Christ that's in this warfare together. We're not alone. And as Lincoln points out, battle imagery had been used extensively in the Qumran literature to depict the community's role in the world. So this idea is also in the Dead Sea Scrolls that the community is in the battle together. Uh, we are working together for one common purpose. And we face the enemy as a group. Not as one individual necessarily. So I think, as uh, Honer said, it applies in both respects. Um, because we are individually in a battle, but we're not alone in the battle. So I think that's important for us to keep uh, in mind as well. And when I read the verses we started out here, I was reading out of the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, because their translation resist... I believe is better than the withstand or stand that other translations have. Because I believe that the idea here that Paul's communicating when he says that um, so that we may be able to resist in the evil day, I believe that what Paul has in mind here is active opposition through verbal confrontation. We see this in Acts 13, 8, where the sorcerer opposed Paul and Barnabas, and this confrontation was verbal. Also in Galatians 2, 11, where Paul opposed Peter, it was a verbal confrontation. And in 2 Timothy 3, 8, where Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, that was also a verbal confrontation. So this Greek term here that the CSB, I believe, correctly translates resist, this, uh, this term conveys the idea of active verbal opposition. And we're going to talk more about this idea of active verbal opposition as we go through the study uh, because it's going to come up as we go through the individual pieces of the armor as well. So Paul also mentions the evil day so that you may be able to resist, as he said, in the evil day. And scholars debate the meaning of what does Paul mean by the evil day. And there are three main views here. One view is that the specific times when the battle is much more intense, the struggle is much deeper, and the attack of the powers of darkness is much stronger and more deceptive, is what Paul means by the evil day. That's one view. Another view is that what Paul has in view here is the whole present age we're living in. And the other main view is that uh, some scholars link it with the day of the Lord, the great eschatological battle. 
Now, I think the command to put on the armor and stand is directed at all believers throughout all generations until the Lord returns. So to sent, to only apply it to the time right before the end, you know, to say what that what this means is the day of the Lord. If that was, um, if that was all it means, and I don't think that's what it means, but um, if that was the if that's what it meant, then I think it would strip um, the meaning, availability, and power for not only the readers of Paul's day but also for all believers who aren't living right before the end of the eschaton. It's like, what would the point of this be for anybody who isn't living a right at the period of the day of the Lord? It wouldn't have any meaning if that's all that's meant by the evil day. And so I, I definitely don't think that that's only what it means. But I do think that Clint Arnold makes a good point here when he says that there's an element of truth to each of the views. Because... Um, I just, I mean, I think that we need to understand it in a broad, uh, in a very broad sense, which would incorporate basically all of these views as to, yeah, that's what, that's what it means. And it's applicable in those periods of time. And so I agree with Thomas Yoder Neufeld when he says, quote, the evil day can thus also be a reference to the day of battle without having its meaning exhausted by apocalyptic notions. So no matter when you're living, unless you're living when Christ is on the earth reigning in Jerusalem, if you're living in any other period of history, you're living in the evil day. And so the armor and call to stand applies to you. And I think that that to me seems, I mean, just obvious that it needs to be applied that way. So again, the reference is to the day of battle in which we find ourselves throughout our lives. Um, it's constant uh, because we live in these days. As Paul said before in Ephesians 5.16, he, he already said that we're living in the, the evil days or the days are evil. And Andrew Lincoln points this out when he says, quote, The call to put on the armor of God and the orientation of the battle are present. The two perspectives of present and future overlap. The readers are to realize they are already in the evil days and that these will culminate in a climactic evil day when resistance will be especially necessary. The armor is the only thing that enables believers to prevail both now and when the final day arrives, end quote. So... I don't know, I mean, we could have, I guess, just skipped that entire section and, and just not even talked about it. And I could have just said, this is talking to us, because clearly it is. But if anybody picks up some of these academic material and runs into this idea where some of the uh, guys are talking about, well, this is talking about the day of the Lord and, uh, you know, the eschatological, the, the end times, I just, I wanted to address it, that uh, it just, it's, it just doesn't make sense to say that all that's being talked about here is the the last day. And most of the scholars don't think that. So I have one more quote about this from the scholars, and it's Clinton Arnold. And he says, quote, Paul is convinced that believers live in the present evil age, and this age is characterized by demonic activity and filled with various forms of evil. The difficulties of the present age will only intensify as the coming of the Lord draws close. The final resolution will come only when God intervenes. There's an interesting verse in Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah 16, 19, and it says, Yahweh, you are my strength and fortress, my refuge in the day of trouble. So that's interesting because Jeremiah, that's very similar to Paul, to what Paul says. Paul says the, uh, the the evil day, and Jeremiah says the day of trouble. Those are very similar terms. And Jeremiah applies that to himself. when He says, Yahweh, you are my strength and fortress, my refuge in the day of trouble. So Jeremiah identified himself as living in this day of trouble or this evil day. And so I think that's the same idea that Paul has um, when the evil day... 
again, is, is broadly, is intended to be broadly applied to our lives here on earth as we are involved in this spiritual battle, this spiritual warfare. So this verse concludes with the phrase, and having done all to stand. And believers are exhorted to stand because they are armed. And Clint Arnold says, Preparation for the battle does not take place once it begins, but well in advance. Paul indicates that a significant investment of time and effort is expended in becoming well prepared for the inevitable attacks. So again, that emphasizes, uh, that quote by Arnold emphasizes the role that we as believers play in this preparation. Um, it's a, uh, it's not a passive thing that we're doing. We have to engage in the process of equipping ourselves with what God has provided. As Marcus Barth points out, taking the term taking up is sometimes a technical military term. It describes the last preparation and final step necessary before the actual battle begins. And Honer says believers can stand defensively against the satanic hosts because they have made all the necessary preparations. So, again, just what these guys are pointing out is that soldiers prepare for battle before the battle. Uh, but since we are born into the battle, we need to prepare now. And it requires discipline. Um, again, we have a part to play. Spiritual discipline is necessary as is knowing our Lord and what he has provided for us. And having done all to stand. And the, that's the goal of the preparation. The, the goal of the preparation is to stand, to keep from falling into sin, and to advance on enemy territory to bring the good news of deliverance to those who are oppressed. And so that, again, that's the offensive component. That once we're prepared, we can advance. In his, in his summary on this uh, verse, Harold Honer says, quote, In conclusion, Paul exhorts believers to put on the full armor of God in order that they might be able to resist in the evil day and to stand defensively against satanic hosts. This is not about victory or defeat. It is about holding fast to territory already won by Christ. The believer needs to realize that the devil and his angels are universal and strong but not omnip omnipotent. Accordingly, the strength of the Lord gained by utilizing the full armor of God is stronger than all the power of the wicked, end quote. Now, I'm not sure exactly what he means when he says the devil and his angels are universal. Uh, I think that what he means by that is that the army of the powers of darkness is very large and it encompasses the globe, basically, that there aren't any places on the earth that you could go to be free from the influence of this spiritual warfare. I think that's what he means by that, but um, I'm not a huge, a super big fan of the wording there, that the devil and his angels are universal. Um, but I do think he clarifies it when he says, but they are not omnipotent. So um, clearly they have a lot of power and they can do a lot of uh, mischief, but they're not... They're not equivalent to God. They're not, they don't know everything. They're, they don't have all power and they don't, they're not everywhere all at the same time. So one evil being can only be in one place at one time. So I think that's what uh, Honer is communicating there. But um, I, I overall, I liked his quote. I liked his conclusion, but I just want to make a comment on that phrase that um, I'm not, again, I just, I'm not a great fan of how he worded that one section, but. I think that's what he means. And a scholar named Chafer, he has an interesting statement here. He says, quote, It is interesting to observe that as pilgrims, we walk. As witnesses, we go. As contenders, we run. And as fighters, we stand. End quote. And I'll end this section with a quote from John Ramirez. He says, When we do not use the weapons of our warfare then we settle for the mediocre Christian life. Instead, let us rise up as the church and cause God's enemies to be scattered. Ephesians 6, 14-18, the Apostle Paul writes, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, 
and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit. This is the detailed description of the armor of light that the Apostle Paul mentioned in Romans 13 verse 12 when he said, So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So in his description of this armor, Paul starts off by saying, Stand, therefore. And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, The verb has the same force throughout, suggesting the stance of the soldier in combat standing firm, resisting, and prevailing against the enemy, end quote. And Paul stresses the need to stand throughout his epistles. It's not just here in Ephesians, but it's throughout his writings. And he desires believers to stand firmly in the position that is theirs in Christ. And that position, as we, as we have mentioned previously in this study, that position in Christ is seated with him in the heavenly realms. And Clinton Arnold says, Quote, this is already the fourth occurrence of the verb stand in this context. And what he means by in this context is in um, chapter 6, verse 10 through 18. So already in our study previously up to this point in the previous verses, we've run into this idea of standing or standing firm. So when Clint Arnold says this is the fourth occurrence, um, he's starting off in verse 10 and up through verse four, uh, 14, this is the fourth occurrence. So Paul is reiterating this repeatedly just in this brief section of scripture, the necessity of standing and standing firm. And Arnold goes on to say, quote, The repetition of this verb strongly emphasizes the goal of the struggle. God not only makes it possible for believers to stand, but expects them to do so by depending on his divine resources. The verb in this context expresses both a defensive posture and an offensive movement into the kingdom of the evil one, end quote. And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, The discussion of the different parts of the believer's armor, which now follows, is illustrative of the main point about the total equipment provided by God, shows what it means to have accomplished everything necessary for battle, and explains how it is that one stands. End quote. And the net translation brings out this meaning very well. They, they actually they seem to emphasize that in their translation. Um, the, um, and what I mean by what they're emphasizing is how one stands. So in the net translation, they have the rendering as stand firm, therefore, by fastening the belt of truth around your waist by putting on the breastplate of righteousness, by fitting your feet with the preparation that comes from the good news of peace, by taking up the shield of faith. So we see there, and I try to emphasize it as I read, they, the, um, the activity in which they translate it by fastening, by putting, by fitting, by taking, that's how we prepare and that's how uh, we stand. And Lynn Kohick says, quote, While Paul's reference point is God's armor, derived from biblical images, he also draws on Roman culture. Roman society promoted military dress as a status indicator. Paul's emphasis on armor is not simply protection against the wicked spiritual forces. The armor also testified to a person's identity and loyalty, end quote. And we've mentioned previously in our study here how... Paul is both drawing on the armor of Yahweh passages in the Old Testament as well as uh, the Roman centurion's um, armor that everybody in that culture would have been familiar with. And we've also mentioned how uh, what, this, what this is here is a description of um, when Paul said in Romans 13, 14, he said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we have here this armor being described that we're about to get into here, he's giving us the, de the details of what it means to put on the Lord Jesus Christ or what it means to put on the armor of light. And as the New Living Translation translates it, they say, of um, that's Romans 13, 14, 
The NLT translates it, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every piece of this armor that we're about to look at is linked to Christ. He is the truth. He is our righteousness. He is our peace. He is our shield. He is the faithful one. He can be trusted. He is our savior. He is the word made flesh. He is the word of God. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. And there are many verses in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that, um, that testify to each of those statements. So now we're going to get into the armor. And the first piece of this armor is the belt of truth. As Paul said, stand your ground putting on the belt of truth. The first piece of armor or the first weapon that Paul names here is truth. We don't often think of belts as weapons, but um, as I get into it, I think that hopefully that part will become uh, clear as to, I think, what Paul is, um, is intending. And Lynn Kohick says, quote, The military belt could be decorated by the individual soldier, but its symbolic significance reflected troop solidarity and unity, end quote. And that's a good point of application right there. As we might each have different ways of communicating truth with others, different ways of decorating our belts, so to speak. But the truth is the truth, no matter how it's communicated. And the belt in the Roman world cinch, cinched up the loose-fitting clothes that were the normal attire of that day. This allowed for better maneuverability, which is obviously an advantage in combat. This belt went underneath the armor, and the rest of the armor was added after the belt was cinched in place. Similarly, we must fasten on truth, rely on and wear the truths of God to tighten up loose thinking and ill-fitting understanding. The truth is step one. Not having truth buckled tightly upon us opens us up to deception, either self-deception or the deception of the enemy. And we are living in the age of deception. We must know the truth. We must have it buckled tightly in place. It's our responsibility. And commenting on the Greek grammar, Harold Honer says, quote, The middle voice indicates that believers are responsible to gird themselves. And the phrase, gird up your loins, is familiar to students of the scripture. It's used frequently throughout the Old Testament. And it's picked up by the New Testament authors as well, not just Paul here, but also Peter. In 1 Peter 1.13, he said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. And what Peter's talking about that there is um, clear thinking. Have our thinking uh, girded up, so to speak, so it's not sloppy. So we're not sloppy with our mindset and our uh, thinking processes and our understanding. We can't be sloppy with the truth. As Paul said in Ephesians 1.13, In him, and that's speaking of Christ, of course, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So as I said, Jesus Christ is the truth. We must know him. Again, remember Romans 13.14. Clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, it's interesting that the first piece of armor that Paul mentions is the truth. And when the disciples ask Jesus about the sign of his coming and the end of the age in Matthew 24, Jesus' first commandment in response was, See to it that no one deceives you. The truth is of primary importance. And just like with the belt in the Roman uh, military attire, everything else went on after the belt was in place. So with us, the truth is in place, and then we can add the rest of the armor on top of that. The scholars also point out that there's a moral aspect being communicated here by Paul. As Clinton Arnold says, quote, truth. This refers to both knowing and appropriating the truth of one's new identity in Christ and developing the practice of speaking and living the truth practicing honesty and living with moral integrity, end quote. As Paul said in Ephesians 4.25, 
Therefore, having laid aside falsehood, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. And as Thomas Yoder Neufeld says, quote, truthing is the mode of the church's divine warfare, end quote. And Tony Evans says, quote, to wear truth like a belt is to live in authenticity before God, end quote. And Clayton Arnold also says, lying and deceitfulness can no longer have any place in the life of a believer. They are an affront to the God of truth. They grieve the Holy Spirit and hinder our relationship with God and our reception of his power. And Harold Honer says, quote, Believers have girded their waists with God's objective truth, which in turn has become a part of them. This piece of armor is basic to all other pieces because truth and trustworthiness are basic to all the other qualities that believers need in order to withstand diabolical attacks. As believers internalize God's truth, they live and move in it." End quote. The next piece of armor is the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6.14 Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest. And in our last study we discussed the belt of truth. So here we're going to of course discuss the breastplate of righteousness and the NLT translates it as the body armor of God's righteousness. And the breastplate protects the vital organs. And as with the belt, the Greek grammar suggests that believers have the responsibility of putting on the breastplate. Roman soldiers would wear either a brass breastplate or a coat of chainmail. So we're commanded, so we're commanded, and it's our responsibility to put on this breastplate. So how do we do that? How do we put on the breastplate? And what is and what is the breastplate uh, represent? What does it mean for us? So a few things here. Firstly, we are covered with the righteousness of Christ. That's number one here. As it says in Isaiah 45, 24, Yahweh is the source of all my righteousness and strength. But that isn't the only thing in view here. Remember also Isaiah 59, 17, which says, For he, God, for God put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as a cloak. And this again is Yahweh's armor that's available to believers in Christ. So there's another layer of meaning to the breastplate of righteousness beyond being clothed in the righteousness of Christ because we see God himself wearing this breastplate of righteousness. And Clinton Arnold refers to John Stott who refers to a scholar named Finley. And Finley says, quote, The completeness of pardon for past offense and the integrity of character that belong to the justified life are woven together into an impenetrable male, end quote. So I think that is uh, what this breastplate is. I agree with that, that it's both the, righteous, the righteousness of Christ applied to us as believers and it's also... Um, a life of righteous living. As John Ramirez says, quote, one of the greatest weapons you can use against the kingdom of darkness is to live a holy life in obedience to Christ. Holiness in the life of the believer is spiritual strength through the Holy Spirit, enabling you to live on the side of victory. The devil knows 100% that holiness is the greatest defense and offense against his wiles and schemes, end quote. And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, doing right and practicing justice is equally vital for the Christian soldier in his or her battle against the powers of evil. Lincoln goes on to say, this is not the justifying righteousness of Romans 3, but an ethical quality, end quote. So what we see here is that righteous living serves as a protection from many injuries. As Proverbs 11 verse 4 says, right living can save you from death. And this isn't talking about salvation. 
It, it's talking about physical death in Proverbs 11, verse 4. So wearing righteousness like a breastplate can protect the believer from much suffering. Walking in the flesh without the armor of God in place, coupled with the temptations and attacks of the enemy, can lead to poor choices and bad decisions, which can ruin lives, both our own and those of others. So going into battle without the breastplate leaves the vital organs open to mortal wounds. And also going through life without righteousness leaves us open to physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual damage. So we can see how this, this metaphor that Paul uses of the breastplate, how it applies to righteousness, because without the breastplate, literal breast, breastplate going into battle, your organs are open to mortal wounds. Likewise, going through life without righteousness can open you up to wounds. Life is hard and has many trials, even when wearing the armor, even when living in personal righteousness. We're not talking about health and wealth here. This isn't the prosperity gospel. But when we're not wearing righteousness, when we're not living it out, as John Ramirez talked about, we leave ourselves open to deeper wounds, even self-inflicted wounds, when we aren't wearing, again, God's armor and standing in the strength of the Lord. If you're not living rightly, your heart is going to hurt, simply put. As Harold, and Harold Honer says, quote, as a soldier's breastplate protected his chest from enemy attacks, so sanctifying righteous living guards believers' hearts against the assaults of the devil. The next piece of the armor is the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. As Ephesians 6.15 says, And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And the Greek word translated fitted is only used in two other places in the New Testament, and both of these places, it's putting on sandals. And once again, the Greek indicates that the believer is responsible for shodding their feet. And Harold Honer says, quote, readiness has its source in the gospel, the contents of which is peace. The Roman soldiers wore shoes that were designed to endure long marches and provide maneuverability in battle. And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, proper footwear is required if the soldier is to be ready for combat, end quote. Well, that seems obvious, of course. And at times the Roman soldiers would wear boots that were studded with nails to ensure a firm grip. And Harold Honer believes that it was this type of footwear that Paul had in mind. And he says, quote, this verb to shod rather than the noun for sandal is used in this context. These were not running sandals, but ones able to dig in with their hollow-headed hobnails and stand against the enemy, end quote. And Lynn Kohick says, quote, Believers' feet are made ready through the gospel of peace because they prepared well in understanding the gospel message. They know the true word of peace gained through Christ's work on the cross and can defend themselves against the devil's lies. The readiness is not related to the work of the evangelist preaching in the city's marketplace, but reflects the verbal defense of one's views to those who ask or challenge the believer's Christian convictions. The gospel is defined as peace, and this peace is found in the person and work of Christ. Lincoln has a bit of a different take, and he says, quote, It is significant that the writer does not refer directly to the footwear, but instead talks of the feet being fitted or shod showing again that he is primarily influenced by the language of an Old Testament passage which mentions feet in connection with proclaiming the gospel of peace, end quote. And that verse is Isaiah 52, verse 7, which says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. And also in Nahum... Uh, chapter 1 verse 15 which says behold upon the mountains the feet of him who brings good news who publishes peace but paul here according to lincoln's view is not emphasizing the preaching of the gospel but the readiness the gospel of peace provides to those who fit it properly as though it were footwear 
So Lincoln says, quote, the reference is not to readiness to proclaim the gospel, but to the readiness or preparedness for combat and for standing in the battle that is bestowed by the gospel of peace. The emphasis is paradoxical. It is the appropriation of the gospel of peace that makes one ready for war. Believers' preparation for standing firm and prevailing against the alienating and fragmenting powers of evil is the harmony produced by the gospel, end quote. So it's interesting that Kohik says that what Paul's talking about is preaching the gospel, and Lincoln says that Paul is definitely not talking about preaching the gospel. So I try to present in my studies here different views, uh, some of the different views of the academic community and the scholars, because it's often interesting where they don't agree and why. Um, and I think here I'm going to present also Clint Arnold's view, and I think he his view is much closer to Lynn Kohick's view, and I tend to agree with Arnold um, in his, in what he says and how he says it. So Arnold here, his view, as I said, is much closer to Kohick's, but it's a, it's has a little bit a slight difference to it. He believes that sharing the gospel of peace is exactly what Paul has in mind, which is the exact opposite of what Arnold's saying. And Arnold says, quote, the third form of preparation is to ready themselves to share the gospel, end quote, which again is directly opposite of what Andrew Lincoln said. So just that's something to keep in mind if anybody out there that's listening to me is also reading the academic material like I am, that these scholars, these you know people who are in that world, the professionals who can read the languages and do this kind of work, don't agree uh, with each other at all times. And often they don't agree. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but Arnold, Clinton Arnold, he quotes a scholar named Opke, who says, quote, Paul has in mind the joyful proclamation of the gospel in the Messianic New Testament period, a readiness for active propagation of the gospel, which is the most effective means of combating satanic powers, end quote. And Marcus Barth, he says, quote, the Messianic peace gives the strength to resist demonic attacks, end quote. So... Again, Clint Arnold is one that believes that the armor is best viewed as both defensive and offensive, and I have agreed with Arnold on that point as we've gone. So again, I think Arnold, and uh, again, since his his view is very similar to Lynn Kohick's view, uh, I think that is the best understanding, at least uh, that's my current understanding here. So... Um, so with that being said, we could ask, who are we at peace with that prepares us to stand in the spiritual warfare? Is this peace with God or peace with others or both? Is this a statement about our being right with God or a statement about the Christian community? And it seems both are in view. And here I like what Andrew Lincoln says, and he says, quote, this is a peace with both vertical and horizontal axes. Peace with God the Father and peace between human beings. Its realization in the church not only sounds the death knell for opposing cosmic powers, but also leads to the intensification of their opposition. A continuing preservation and appropriation of the gospel of peace is necessary if the powers are to be resisted and if believers are to be ready to make their stand in the world. The stand that is in line with their calling." End quote. So in other words, just as the Roman soldiers' boots were studded with nails to ensure their immovability and preparedness to stand firm in any situation, so we as believers are to have our feet fitted and studded with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The peace we have with God and other believers are the nails in our boots that prevent us from being pushed around by the world and the evil powers that control it. We're not going to battle with the uncertainty of flip-flops. We're going with the confidence of the nail-studded boots of the gospel of peace. The darkness has been defeated and Christ is our peace, as Paul said in Ephesians 2.14. And we stand in him and because of him. As Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. And Clinton Arnold says, quote, The proclamation of the gospel represents a major assault on the kingdom of Satan. 
The heart of the gospel message is the good news that Jesus Christ can now be our peace because he has shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. Spreading the good news means opposing the work of the principalities and powers who endeavor to blind the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And Arnold goes on to say, Christian soldiers do not stay in the camp, but move out into enemy territory. This is the point of the preparation of the gospel of peace. Believers are called to prepare themselves to share the gospel wherever the commander, the Lord, calls them to go, end quote. And multiple scholars note the paradox of Paul mentioning peace in a passage detailing war. And Marcus Barth says, it seems paradoxical that the Messiah's peace should issue in war, end quote. And Harold Honer, as I've often used him as a sort of summary, um, as we end each of the pieces of armor, I'm so going to use him here. He says, quote, it is the believer's sure-footedness in the tranquility of the mind and security of the heart in the gospel of peace that gives them readiness to stand against the devil and his angelic hosts. It is somewhat paradoxical that the gospel of peace is the preparation for warfare against the hosts of evil." End quote. Ephesians 6.16, 6, Paul says, In all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And this reminds me of a couple of Psalms. Psalm 91, verse 4 and 5, and speaking of God, it says, His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day. And Psalm 76, verse 3 says, There he, and it's speaking of God again, there he has broken the fiery arrows of the enemy. So here we see again that Paul was drawing his imagery for the armor of God from Old Testament passages. And in these two Psalms, we see faithfulness is a shield. And also we see this reference to the fiery arrows of the enemy. Now, Andrew Lincoln and Harold Honer, they argue that the translation should read, in addition to all these, take up the shield of faith. And this line of scholarly thought is reflected in the New Living Translation, as they have the verse, In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. So, these scholars believe that in addition to all of these is a reference, of course, to the armor that Paul has mentioned before. So, he's saying, in addition to all of these, also take up the shield of faith. So, uh, that's just a difference in the... Uh, translation options there. And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, The last of the pieces of spiritual armor, which are virtues or attitudes to be practiced by the believer, is the shield of faith. Now let me break in right there because what he's saying is, he's not saying that um, the helmet and the sword of the spirit that we're going to talk about as we continue, he's not saying that those aren't part of the armor. But what he's saying here when he says that the last pieces of the spiritual armor, he's talking about the virtues uh, that we've discussed. So the belt of truth calls on the believer to be truthful. The breastplate of righteousness calls for the believer to live a righteous life. Uh, the, the preparation of the gospel of peace calls on the believer to uh, be at peace um, and live out peace. So that's what he's saying when he says, that these pieces of the armor are virtues. And so when he's saying that the last piece of these is the shield of faith, he's saying because it's calling on the believer to be faithful, to have faith. So that's what he means when he says, um, when he says that. And he goes on to say, quote, Faith is the confident trust in and receptiveness to Christ and his power that protects the whole person. Faith takes hold of God's resources in the midst of the onslaughts of evil, and produces the firm resolve which douses anything the enemy throws at the believer. And this reminds me of Jesus' words in Luke 10, 19, where he said to the disciples, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. 
Now the Greek word thyreos is used of an oblong shield shaped like a door that covers the whole man. And that's the word that Paul uses here for shield of faith. It's this word, um, it's a big shield shaped like a door and it covers the whole man. The Roman soldiers would at times use their shields in what was known as the tortoise formation. Now, according to the website Imperium Romanum, the tortoise was a defensive tactic used by Ro Roman legionaries to defend themselves against archer fire. It consisted in creating a compact rectangular formation in which legionaries for from the first row and sides of the formation held their shields vertically in front of them and from their exposed side while legionaries from the inner ranks held their shields horizontally above each other and over the legionaries of the first and side ranks, thus creating a cover for the entire formation against enemy arrows. The legionaries moving in such a column during the battle resembled a shelled turtle. A well-used turtle was an excellent shield against ranged units, and the soldiers could move around the battlefield without fear. The testudo formation was so strong, tight, and resilient that it was said to be able to withstand the weight of a horse walking on the shields and even a towed cart going across the shields. And if this is what Paul has in mind, it would be a reminder to the Ephesians that they are stronger together. The tortoise formation required the soldiers to work as a unit. The unity of believers is in Christ. We can see the clear parallels there. The tortoise was also most effective in a siege situation when the, when the army was advancing against a fortified city. It allowed them to get close by offering protection against arrows shot from above. As Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And gates are for defense. So Jesus here is describing hell as under siege. And picking up on that, Paul here in Ephesians 6.16 says that hell's army shoots flaming arrows. So it makes sense when you think of it in the culture of that time, they would have been familiar with this Roman formation and how it can advance um, being sheltered because the, the, um, the army unit held their shield in such a way that everybody was protected. And Thomas Yoder Neufeld agrees with this interpretation, and he sees the arrows as being shot by the powers of darkness as the saints place them under siege. And once again, this views uh, the armor as having offensive capability, which, as I mentioned before, is the interpretation that I take as well. And the, so the shield for the believer is faith. And Marcus Barth here, he sees the shield of faith as referring to both our faith in God and the faithfulness of God himself. He sees it as both. So some verses in support of his view would be John 17, 15. In Jesus' high priestly prayer to the Father, he says, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. So there in that instance, we would see the faithfulness of God being a safety for the believers. In 2 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, it says, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. So there again, we see the faithfulness of the Lord as a guard. And Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to him for protection. And the King James translates that as, He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So there in the King James, we see both of... Um, both of the options of what Barth is talking about, as the believers put their trust in God, God is a shield to them. So we see it work both ways here, it would seem. And I do like Marcus Barth's view. And it seems that Paul shared a similar view, as he told Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. So there we see Paul is the one who's trusting and the Lord is the one who's guarding him. So like a shield. And if we remember also, Yahweh told Abram in the book of Genesis that he said, Abram, I am your shield. So God is our shield and we are called to place our trust in him. Now that's Barth's view. He, he viewed it again as it being both 
our faith in God and God's faithfulness, the majority of scholars believe that it's our trust in God that's in view, that that's what's being predominantly, um, even some of them say that's really the only thing that Paul has in mind here. Uh, and Clinton Arnold will be representative of this view, and he says, quote, faith is the medium by which one can gain divine empowerment and experience a greater measure of the exalted and victorious Christ's presence, end quote. And Paul also, he says that faith extinguishes the flaming arrows. And the scholars mention the different types of arrows that the enemy sends at believers. Deception, accusation, temptation being among these arrows. And both Origen and Jerome interpreted the arrows to be evil thoughts sent into the minds of believers. And I think we should expand this also to include emotions, demonic dreams, false teaching, and more. Despair, doubt, fear, depression, etc. can all be sent by the enemy. Now, I'm not saying that every time we experience some of these emotions that it is from the enemy. Uh, the only one of those that I read that I would say is always of the enemy would be demonic dreams and false teaching. That those things are always inspired or sent as flaming arrows uh, to lead people astray in various ways. But the other ones, the emotional aspect, those can be, I believe, caused by these flaming arrows. But I think they can also be caused just because we live in a fallen world. So I don't want to be misunderstood as saying that if anybody's in, you know, feeling depressed or afraid that those are necessarily flaming arrows, but I think it's possible that they could be. As I do believe that these things can be used at times in an attempt to stifle or prevent the Christian from living a life filled with the power of God. As Clinton Arnold says, quote, faith in Christ and his word can repel demonic attacks. End quote. And when we discuss the, um, the sword of the Spirit, we're going to talk about how that is the spoken word of God used in opposition to the enemy. Uh, so this is going to come up again when we discuss that aspect of the armor in a future, one of our future sessions here. But as we're in this spiritual battle, we need to expect attacks and counterattacks. The devil is wily, and his schemes and attacks are varied and broad. So if he attacks us one way, you know, we hold up our shield of faith, we use the word of God and the sword of the spirit and these things that we've been studying and will continue to study, the devil's not just going to quit. As it says when he was tempting Jesus, at the end of that temptation, it says the devil left him until a more opportune time. He didn't quit. He waited until another opportunity presented itself to where he could... Um, come at Jesus, attack Jesus, and tempt him in different ways. And we see that throughout his ministry, um, even including the time when he rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. As in that instance, Peter was doing uh, the work of the devil and trying to get Jesus to not go to the cross. So we should expect these counterattacks um, as we grow in our faith, as we learn how to implement some of this armor. Uh, that doesn't mean the devil's going to give up. They're going to come, they're going to try to come uh, in different ways in more unexpected and so forth uh, attacks. And the Athenian general uh, Thucydides stated in his writings that the leather coating of each, each shield was soaked in water before the battle, and this neutralized the flaming arrows of the enemy. So in the same way, we need to soak our faith in the living water. We need to soak our faith in the living water. And Paul clearly says that our shield, faith, is capable of extinguishing all the flaming arrows. Not some of them, it says all of them. And multiple scholars point out that soldiers would often abandon the shield during the course of battle for various reasons. And that once the shield was abandoned, the soldier was unprotected. And this would obviously prove fatal. And Harold Honer says, quote, Believers must be wary of laying aside their shields of faith and attempting to fight the battle in their own strength, end quote. Now, I've heard stories of Christians who went into spiritual warfare situations with self-confidence rather than being prayed up and advancing with their shields held high, and they got hammered. 
And when they later return to the same situation with their armor properly fitted, their shields up, and with prayer, they had success. The spiritual warfare isn't something to be entered lightly. Neither is the Christian life. The Christian life isn't something to be uh, just flippantly lived out or um, just assumed that we can say something like, I'm a Christian, I got this. Um, that if we adopt that kind of an attitude, we're not going, we shouldn't expect to have success in the Christian life and in the spiritual warfare. We don't got this apart from Christ. As it says in Hebrews 11, in the famous Hall of Faith, that it was through faith that men quenched raging fire. It wasn't by their own greatness. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't, were, were, when they were thrown into the flaming furnace, the fiery furnace, they didn't say, we're awesome and the flame won't touch us. They said, our God can protect us or save us. So it's through faith that the flaming uh, fire, the raging fire is quenched. As Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, it says, Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. So again, that kind of goes to what I was saying a minute ago, that lions hunt. They don't come out their prey the same way every time. They're skilled hunters. And Peter is saying the devil is like that. So we have to resist him, firm in our faith. As Romans 8.37 says, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And as the New Living Translation puts it, Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 6 verse 17, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now the interesting issue here is, is that Yahweh wears the helmet of salvation in Isaiah 59. And Yahweh doesn't need to be saved in the sense that that word is generally used. He is the one who saves. He doesn't need to be saved himself. So how can he wear this helmet and then give it to us? How can we be wearing the same helmet that he wears when it's called the helmet of salvation? Because we need to be saved and he's the one who saves. I think the answer to this question is found in the meaning of the term soterios, which is the Greek word translated as salvation in the helmet of salvation. And this word carries multiple meanings. One of the meanings is, quote, he who embodies salvation or the one through whom God achieves salvation, end quote. So I think it's that definition of the word that gives us the understanding. In the context of Isaiah 59, when Yahweh puts on the armor, including the helmet of salvation, it's because there is no mediator, no man to carry out justice, righteousness, or truth. So his own arm brings salvation to the people. And the arm of Yahweh is another way of saying the Messiah. So it's the Messiah that brings salvation to the people. It's the Messiah who wears the armor. And the Messiah is Yahweh incarnate. It's Jesus Christ, God in um, human flesh. And it's Jesus Christ who won the salvation and then gives it to whoever believes in him. And that's how we can wear his helmet or any of the other pieces of his armor. He achieved the victory, provides us with his own armor, and calls us to join him. Now you could say, how does he call us to join him? In what sense does he call us to join him in wearing the helmet of salvation? And I suggest the answer to that question is um, understood when we determine what type of salvation is being referred to. So Clinton Arnold says here that Paul is, quote, not as much speaking about the certainty of deliverance at the end of time as the present dimension of salvation. And Harold Honer agrees with that. He says, quote, Paul is referring to a present day experiential salvation from the attacks of the wicked one, as opposed to salvation from a future judgment as envisioned in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. 
And 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 says, But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. So what Honer is saying there is that in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, when Paul talks about the helmet being the hope of salvation, that in that context, Paul is referring to um, what he's calling the future judgment sense of salvation. So um, we are, we come when we come by faith to Christ, we pass from death to life. So we're not going to experience... Um, the judgment of God, because our judgment has been paid by Christ. So the salvation in the future sense is what Honer believes is meant by the helmet of the helmet being the hope of salvation. First Thessalonians five eight, but he's saying that he doesn't believe that that's what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians six. Honer goes on to say, "quote It does not in Ephesians six refer to salvation in the objective sense." but a conscious possession of it in the midst of the onslaughts of the evil one. With his head protected, the soldier feels safe in the midst of battle. Likewise, believers' possession of salvation gives them confidence of safeness during assaults of the devil." End quote. So, Christ won our salvation. And we can now wear his helmet for protection in our spiritual battles. So he calls us to join him in this, uh, this knowledge that we have his protection because he has achieved the victory. He has gone before us wearing this armor. He's battle tested it. He's proven it. He has won. And now he gives us the armor, the armor of God, the armor that has proven been proven in battle by God himself. So as Marcus Barth says, quote, when he says, believers wear the same battle-proven helmet that God straps on his head. Christ has already worn this into battle and he has conquered. He has won the ultimate victory and he gives it to us to join him in that confidence as we go through our struggles, um, daily life, the attacks of the enemy, and so forth. It's this knowledge of the possession of salvation and this confidence that we have as we join Christ um, by walking in him. As again, as Paul said in Colossians 2, 6, therefore, as you received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. So in the spiritual warfare, since the helmet protects the mind, as Paul said in Romans 12, 2, be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So in addition to these other things that I've just mentioned, the helmet of salvation protects and renews our minds as well. Again, as we walk in Christ, in the confident assurance that his victory is the ultimate victory and that we are safe in him as we walk out our daily lives um, in spiritual warfare and um, in the assaults of the enemy that we uh, that come at us just because we live in this world and because we are we belong to Christ. So um, trying to wrap my mind wrap my head around the helmet of salvation was uh, to me the most difficult of all the armor to understand because of that nuance of, God wearing this helmet and then giving it to us. And, and again, and we don't need to be saved in the same uh, fashion that he would wear the helmet for. So I would say this is the one that I had the most, um, I wrestled with the most. And so I think uh, that is where I've, that's where I've come out with this um, up to now. My understanding at this point is, um, Again, it's because we are uh, called by Christ to join him and he has already achieved this salvation and gives it to us. So we have this confidence that Christ is who he said he is, that he did what he did, and we're secure in him from whatever comes our way. 
In the second part of Ephesians 6, verse 17, Paul says to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Roman short sword was designed for close combat. The Roman soldiers would generally lead with the shield and then thrust with the sword. The word Paul uses here for sword is the word for a short sword, which is a distinct word from the long sword. It's two different words in the Greek. So we can ask ourselves, as the, when we look at the Roman soldiers, they use this short sword to conquer the known world, I mean, for the most part. Um, the, Roman, the Roman military was feared the world over because of how good they were with this short sword in close quarters combat. So when we see Paul say that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, we can ask ourselves, how effective are we in close combat with the sword God has provided us? As Andrew Lincoln says, quote, The Spirit is the one who gives the sword its effectiveness, its cutting edge. And Harold Honer says, that in accordance with the offensive nature of this weapon, it has the idea of offensive empowerment by the Holy Spirit necessary in a spiritual battle. The sword of the Spirit is held in the belt of truth. Now, that's an interesting statement by Honer there. He's, he's saying that the sword of the Spirit is basically carried in the belt of truth. So we have to have our belt of truth properly fitted in order to carry the sword properly. And the sword is the weapon the Holy Spirit uses to convict, rebuke, exhort, comfort, and more. As Jesus said in John 14, 26, The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and will cause you to remember everything I said to you. So we see the Holy Spirit also brings to mind the words of God, which is the sword when we need them. But it's also our job to have the Word of God firmly implanted in our hearts and minds so the Spirit has something to remind us of. Again, notice Jesus' exact words. He said that the Spirit will cause you to remember. Now, you can only remember something that you've heard or taken into inside yourself. So part of this is um, a call upon us to be familiar with the words that God has spoken so that in the moment we need them, the Holy Spirit can bring them to our remembrance. And Paul may again be leaning here on Isaiah for his imagery. In Isaiah 11 verse 4 in the Septuagint, it says, He shall smite the earth with the word of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he destroy the ungodly one. And this same idea is found also in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, which says, And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. And again in Revelation 19, 15, speaking of Jesus, it says, From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations, and the sharp sword that comes from his mouth is the word of God. And the Greek word here, that's translated word, is rima. And it means the spoken word. But also, and this is important, the spoken words of God have been written down in the scriptures. As Marcus Barth says, quote, Rima can mean words of God that are found in the Old Testament or the words of the Lord that are quoted by Paul and later gathered in the Gospels, end quote. And we see an example of this usage in Matthew 4, verse 4. And when Jesus was being tempted by the devil... He said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus here, when he says every word, that's rima in the Greek. So he's quoting Deuteronomy 8, which obviously is written scripture. But Jesus quotes that because in Deuteronomy, in the Septuagint, it's rima. So it's the spoken word of God, right? Every word that comes from the mouth of God is spoken by God, and then it's written down. So while there is a distinction between Rima and Logos, Rima would be, again, the spoken word, Logos, the written word. Um, there, is some, uh, there is some overlap because the, the Rima words of God from his own mouth were written down. 
But the scholars, they do believe that it's the spoken word that Paul has in mind here. So Gary Brashears, Harold Honer, and Thomas Yoder Neufeld, they all believe that what we're to understand here is that Paul means the spoken or proclaimed word. As Yoder Neufeld says, quote, it suggests the full force of uttering the divine word as a means of assault on the powers, end quote. And he also suggests the possibility that Rima here should be seen as a means of confrontation and judgment. And it's the spoken word of God, the proclaimed word, that's to be used against the evil powers. And again, that's, that's what Jesus did. That's how Jesus did it. And the spoken word is the means of confrontation and judgment. And if you remember when we discussed verse 13 we discussed the importance of resisting through verbal opposition. And again, that's what's being communicated here. In order to actively proclaim the word of God, we must know it and understand it. The sword is the understood, proclaimed word of God. We must have the word so deeply ingrained within us that we can express it by word and deed. This requires understanding of the word to be able to speak it effectively to bring truth into a context of lies. And if you remember in our introduction to this series, I, I referenced um, Ezekiel 3 verse 10. And I don't have the verse right here in front of me, but it was the Lord was telling Ezekiel that um, Ezekiel was to take God's words deep within his own heart first and then go to the people. So this idea of taking the word of God deeply into ourselves, into our own hearts first, before we can then go and speak it. So I think that also applies here. As Harold Honer says, quote, This is not preaching the gospel, but speaking God's word against his foes. It is speaking the words of God in Christ's name, empowered by God's spirit, end quote. And John Ramirez says, quote, study scripture and memorize God's word. Then when the devil shows up, use it as the sword of the spirit against the forces of darkness. Let it form the prayers that come out of your mouth. The number one weapon for believers is realizing that the more we live in God's word, the more discernment, revelation, and clarity we have against the forces of darkness, end quote. As it says in Hebrews 4, 4 verse 12, For the word of God is living and active, and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing even to the point of dividing soul from spirit and joints from marrow. It is able to judge the desires and thoughts of the heart. And the last verse of our study, Ephesians 6 verse 18 Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So prayer is the seventh item, the completion of the armor. Prayer is at the heart of spiritual warfare. As Harold Honer says, prayer is the vehicle of believers to address their Heavenly Father in the name of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that may seem obvious, like why would I even go through giving that definition? And, that, and I did that because all religions, including the New Age, have some version of prayer. So defining our terms is always a good idea and is very important. I want to make clear that when we're talking about prayer in the Christian sense, it's addressing our Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about when we say prayer in Christian spiritual warfare. As Marcus Barth points out, in the Old Testament and later Jewish literature, prayer is depicted as a battle. In 2 Maccabees chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, it says, But Judas's men, and the Judas here is Judas Maccabeus, But Judas's men battled against their enemies with appeals and prayers fighting with their hands, but praying to God with their hearts. So prayer is the weapon God has given believers to pull down strongholds and destroy the schemes of the devil. 2 Corinthians 10.4 The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are powerful through God for the demolition of strongholds. 
And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, as regards syntax, verses 18 and through 20 are clearly joined to what is preceded through the two participial clauses of verse 18. This makes clear that the themes of spiritual warfare and watching and praying are in fact closely connected, end quote. So some people will say that uh, the spiritual warfare section ends at verse 17, and then this is a new section, but what Lincoln's pointing out is that no, in the Greek, these things are joined by the Greek syntax. Now, most everybody uh, believes that prayer is not a part of the armor. Uh, I tend to think that it is. I tend to think that it's the final piece of the armor. And we notice that Paul stresses the word all. And the repetition of the word all stresses the vital importance of prayer. So Paul said, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. So he used the word all four times in the verse. And again, this stresses the vital importance of prayer. Praying at all times in the Spirit emphasizes the power source, which is the Holy Spirit, or who is the Holy Spirit. He's a person. And we need the Spirit's constant guidance, direction, and wisdom as we pray. The Holy Spirit prompts us, energizes us, and directs us both to pray and how to pray. As Paul said in Romans 8.26, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And Paul's call for alertness and all perseverance points to the constancy of the spiritual struggle and the necessity of never letting our spiritual guard down, never letting that armor slip. As we keep alert and watchful, we will also recognize more opportunities to pray. And I think we can all see that that's true uh, just from our own experience, I know I can, that if we're not focused on the Lord, we're walking more in the flesh at a particular stage of life, we're not really interested in praying, uh, we're, you know, we, we may come across many opportunities or situations that if we're walking in the Spirit, we would feel that prompting, hey, pray for this right now. Just give a quick prayer for this situation or this person or whatever. Uh, but if we're not walking in the Spirit, if we're not alert, if we're not um, maybe persevering as much in our spiritual disciplines, uh, we are not going to um, recognize these opportunities and sense the prompting of the Spirit in those moments. And the Greek word translated persevere can also mean persistent obstinately, or sorry, persist obstinately. So we are to persist obstinately in prayer. And Andrew Lincoln says that, quote, the immediate context of the battle against evil powers only makes all the clearer the constant need for calling on divine power, end quote. And Honer says that it is unceasing prayer that, that's being talked about there. Unceasing prayer. As we wrestle against spiritual powers of darkness, we need to be reliant upon the ultimate power, the Holy Spirit. And Chuck Missler called prayer action at a distance and said that it was the believer's heavy artillery. So, so Chuck, he viewed prayer as a part of the armor. And I agree with Chuck on this one. Uh, I agree with Chuck on a lot of things. I really um, have been blessed by his teaching. So prayer is the believer's heavy artillery. As Thomas Yoder Newfield says, prayer itself becomes a way in which the community intervenes on behalf of all the saints. Prayer is not only an entreaty for God to see the needs of the saints, but is itself a response to those needs. So again, um, emphasizing the, the communal aspect of spiritual warfare, right? That we're not in this alone, but we're in it together. So... That's what Yoder Neufeld's pointing out, is that prayer um, is a way in which the community in, intervenes on behalf of the saints, is on behalf of the other members of the community. Now, Paul also stresses alertness. Alertness is needed so we can pray constantly as the Spirit leads. 
As Lincoln says, quote, to be alert involves renouncing the spiritual sleep of the darkness of this age. That's a great line. Renouncing the spiritual sleep of the darkness of this age. He goes on to say, there is now also stress on the need for effort and self-discipline on the part of believers in order to avoid spiritual complacency and fatigue and pursue a life of prayer, end quote. And Honer makes a good point here. He says, quote, prayer causes alertness and alertness keeps believers in prayer. I think that's very similar to what I was trying to say a minute ago, but he said in a very, uh, very concise there. Prayer causes us to be alert, and being alert keeps us in prayer. And Honer goes on to say, if they are not alert, they do not see the dangers and thus no need to pray. Thus see no need to pray. That's also, I agree with that. Again, because if we're not paying attention and walking in the Spirit, we don't, we don't see the spiritual situations around us because we're just we're not paying attention and if we don't see what's going on around us spiritually we don't feel the need to pray so that's why alertness is so crucial as peter says in chapter 5 first peter 5 8 and 9 stay alert watch out for your great enemy the devil he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour stand firm against him and be strong in your faith as Paul says in Colossians 4, 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. So again, this idea of alertness is echoed throughout the New Testament. And Clinton Arnold says, quote, believers need to be in a constant state of prayer because they do not know when they will come under a demonic assault and thus need always to be ready. Also, there will always be people in the community who are under attack and desperately need the members of the body to be appealing to God in their behalf, end quote. So again, he's also pointing out that um, the idea of prayer is for the community. The community to come together to pray for each other and also for individuals to pray um, as they go through their daily lives. So it's both. As Jesus told his disciples in Mark 14, 38, watch ye and pray lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And Andrew Lincoln quotes a scholar named Lovestam, who said, quote, For the one who fails to keep awake, but is entangled and absorbed in this world and age, this becomes hindering and devastating for the prayer life, end quote. As Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, we could easily read that verse and miss Peter's point entirely. So we could read that and we could say, you know, read where Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. So we look at that and we go, oh man, it's the end times. So let's, you know, be all about studying Bible prophecy. And while I am a huge fan of Bible prophecy, um, in fact, the next series I'm planning on after this one is the book of Revelation. So I'm not against the study of prophecy by any means, but that's not what Peter's point is. He says the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Why? Not so that you can better identify the end time events, but for the sake of your prayers. So what Peter's saying is, hey guys, we're in the end times, so pay attention and pray more. Now, that kind of goes against, I think, what we usually do or what I, you know, what I would usually do. We recognize that we're in the end time, so we study the scriptures, we study the prophecies, we try to figure out um, the, you know, what's, what's being said, how close are we to certain events. And because we see the things in the scriptures and the best we can understand it, we don't really pray about it. And that's not what Daniel did when Daniel recognized that prophecy was about to be fulfilled based on his understanding of Jeremiah, he went to the God in prayer about it and asked God to, you know, fulfill it. That's what Peter's saying. Hey, we're in the end times, so pay attention and pray more. This is important. And Paul also stresses the need for perseverance, because perseverance is needed to overcome fatigue and discouragement. It's easy to, it's easy to become discouraged. Um, in the times we live in, um, 
it's very, very easy to become discouraged and to become fatigued. And like, oh, I've, I've read the Bible or, oh, I've been, you know, I'm tired of, you know, whatever. I'm tired of going to church or I'm tired of praying or, you know, whatever the case may be. But perseverance is needed to overcome these things, to overcome fatigue, to overcome discouragement and to keep going. And Paul's encouragement at the end, his final encouragement in the verse, is to pray for all the saints, all the holy ones. And this emphasizes once again the corporate nature of spiritual warfare. We aren't in it alone. We may feel alone at times, but we are never alone. Even if no human being is with us, God is always with us. And Paul gives an example in Colossians 4 verse 12 when he said, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. So Paul lifts up this man Epaphras as a prayer warrior. That's what we would say in our vernacular. Uh, Paul says that he's always struggling on behalf of his people in his prayers. This man Epaphras doesn't take prayer lightly. He takes prayer as a, you know, as a battle and more of a spiritual warfare sense. He's struggling on their behalf in his prayers. And Harold Honer has a great line towards the end of his commentary on this section, he says, quote, Nuclear wars cannot be won with rifles. Likewise, satanic wars cannot be won by human energy, end quote. As John Ramirez says, quote, We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are to take no prisoners in prayer, end quote. So as we come to the end of our study on Ephesians 6, the end of our study on spiritual warfare, I have a couple of, uh, actually three, I have three quotes um, from, well, I have two quotes from scholars and then one quote from a, uh, a preacher, a pastor. As they summarize uh, their views on the armor of God, they summarize their views on spiritual warfare, uh, just kind of summary statements on the things we've been studying. So Lynn Kohick says, quote, the armor of God does not protect against suffering, nor does it preserve a believer from a painful death. The armor is not a good luck charm that keeps sadness at bay or misfortune from entering a believer's life. The armor strengthens believers as they encounter sorrow, pain, misfortune, and injustice that characterize the present evil age. By remembering what is true, by holding to what is just, by listening to the Savior's word of peace, Believers, together in the church, can withstand the evil forces that seek to destroy all goodness and hope, end quote. So, it's not this, uh, spiritual warfare is not a, a prosperity gospel thing. It's not a, um, a path to guaranteed carefree life. Um, of no hassles. Um, it's the armor that God provides us as we go through the battle. Right? Battles are not easy. But God has provided us the victory in Christ. And Andrew Lincoln says, quote, Believers must reckon with superhuman agencies. The world is not neutral territory, but a battleground. In quote. Um, that's a great line. The world is not neutral territory, but a battleground. And this reminds me of a quote from the 2018 movie, The Predator. Um, I don't know how many people saw that. Probably not all that many. But there's a line in there. One of the soldiers says, I dropped from my mother's womb. I hit the floor and I started crawling through hostile territory toward my grave. Now, in the movie, this soldier was not a Christian. So that was his secular... A view of a life that was he was born into this battle. Now I would edit parts of that, but the overall idea we can apply, and I think it's again what Lincoln said there, the world is not neutral territory but a battleground. We were born into this battle and we are on hostile territory until Christ comes back and sets up his kingdom uh, Paul says in Ephesians that Satan is still the god of this age. So we are on enemy territory. And Lincoln goes on to say, quote, 
The opposition has already been defeated, but while history as we know it continues, the remainder of the battle must be fought to a conclusion. It is striking that a letter which in its first half depicts the peace produced by the gospel should in its second half conclude with an emphasis on war. But this only underlines that God's purposes are not yet complete and that the powers that are hostile to the well-being of believers, to the existence of the church, and to the advance of the gospel have not yet given up their ultimately futile opposition. In this way, the readers are given a realistic perspective on Christian existence and disabused of any naive notion that living out their calling in the world will be an effortless or trouble-free assignment, end quote. And the last uh, quote here goes to Tony Evans, and he says, quote, You have to fight the spiritual with the spiritual. Your human strength won't work. Your only hope is to be strengthened by the Lord and to put on the full armor of God. Through the cross and resurrection of Christ, victory is already won. The devil has lost. We are to stand firm in Christ's victory. Amen. And with that, we'll conclude our study here. Um, thank you all for joining me on this study. I hope it blessed you. I know it blessed me as I prepared it. I hope we, we all learned some things maybe we didn't know before and um, are encouraged to, as Paul said, take up this armor so that we're prepared both offensively and defensively as we go through our lives in this battle, this spiritual warfare battle in which we are all uh, born, in which we all live. So... Here are the list of the sources that I use in preparing this study. They will also be in the description of the video. And there's a link in the description to Gary Brashear's course on biblicaltraining.org. It's a course he taught on spiritual warfare, and it's free. All you have to do is make an account, which is free, and then you have access to the course by Dr. Brashear. So I would encourage everybody to... Uh, go over to biblicaltraining.org and uh, sign up for that and, and watch Dr. Brashear's um, go through a lot of this material. Um, so with that being said, thank you all for listening. Uh, I, hope, I hope you're all blessed by this, and we'll uh, see you all in the next video.